Well, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, man. Wow, we are, as you've already heard once, but I have to say, uh, we're so delighted that you've chosen to gather with us here in the Epic Church community for Christmas. For all of you who are from somewhere else, welcome in. Thanks for coming to San Francisco, coming to see your kids or grandkids or friends, or some of you are just here for a fun like tourist trip. We're so thrilled that you have prioritized gathering on Christmas Eve to celebrate the coming of the Messiah. We believe today uh, God's going to speak to you. And uh, even if you don't believe that there is a God, I'm going to give you just a quick, short, like 20-second breath prayer opportunity just to say, God, would you speak to me? So go ahead, like, God, would you speak to me? We've been planning for this gathering, but I think I can't go any further without you joining me in really appreciating the level of excellence and creativity and inspiration that our worship team and our production team gave us today. Anybody? I mean, you know what this is like in your, in your work. When you work on an incredible team, surrounded by people with so many God-given gifts, um, you just turn them loose and see what God might do. And so um, Seth, Miguel, B, everyone that's playing, uh, this is being broadcast literally around the world. So if you are joining us, um, maybe it's already Christmas Day where you are, uh, but we're thrilled that you're gathering either in person or online. We've been in this Advent season, and um, here's what's true. When you're always longing for something in the, that's in the future, waiting becomes a daily reality in your life. And I know all of you are just as patient as I am, and you just love waiting. Anybody? Like, it's just like your favorite thing. Um, we're all waiting for something, aren't we? Uh, some of you are just waiting for this message to be over so you can get on with the real reason for Christmas in your mind. Um, <laughs> You could be waiting to see family. Anybody waiting to see family over the holidays? Anybody waiting and hoping you don't have to see any family? Yeah. Um, some of you are waiting to see family over the holidays. I'm in that camp. Um, it's the first Christmas since our firstborn has been alive that he's not here with us. But we're, we're going to get to him, Lord willing, by uh, tomorrow night. So that's a whole new experience for us. I know um, because we're a church made up of 60 different nations, which is one of my favorite things about leading this church, I know some of you are, are waiting for 2024 uh, to be the year you gain your citizenship. And uh, we just encourage you. I know some of you are green card, others of you have full-blown citizenship. Um, you're waiting for that, though. Uh, some of you, you wouldn't say this at church, but I know you're waiting to see your company's year-end numbers to know whether or not you're getting a bonus this year. And you're like, I hope I am because I already spent that. <laughs> I hope that happens as you wait for the numbers to come in. Uh, I, I know in this group of people, full room like this, that some of you are waiting to have children, and you're not sure if your waiting will ever come to fruition. I think all of us are waiting to see what 2024 is going to bring in. And as we look at all that's happening around us, I think, can we not all just join John Mayer and sing, we keep waiting, waiting, <laughs> waiting, seriously though, on the world to change? Anybody? You see, we're all waiting, but we're not all waiting in the same way. Some of you are waiting with things like despair, present, and anxiety, and fear. Others of you, though, you might be waiting with things like hope, and peace, and a lot of faith. Here's the question you'll see on the screen. Are, are you anticipating and expecting bad news or good news? I mean, I'll be the first to say, Ben, have you seen what the world has been like this year? How would we anticipate and expect anything other than bad news? Listen, I'm not here to tell you that bad news isn't coming your way, but I want to give you this from the psalmist who knew what it was like to live in a world that's filled with bad news and still experience a reality that wasn't anchored to that news, but to something more solid than the news. And if you, can I just be honest today? Like, we need to have something we can anchor ourselves besides the news. Would you agree? Some of you aren't sleeping already because of an election that's coming up in 11 months, and all of us have things we should be heartbroken and praying over, but listen to what the psalmist says. It's all good. I don't need that. Psalm 112, verses 6 through 8. You'll see it on the screen. Surely the righteous will never be shaken. They will be remembered forever. They will have no fear of bad news. Their hearts are steadfast. Anybody would love to have that reality? Yeah. Trusting in the Lord. Their hearts are secure. They will have no fear. In the end, they will look in triumph on their foes. The psalmist isn't saying that 
2024 won't be filled with bad news, both in our world, perhaps, and certainly in all of our lives. In fact, we're not guaranteed that we will make it through the next seven days of 2023 without any bad news. But he is telling us that we can trust in a way, we can anchor our faith to a God for whom we don't have to allow what we're afraid of or the bad news that will probably come. We don't have to allow that to be the dominant narrative in our lives. And if there's anything you and I could all use moving into 2024 would be a shift in how we tell ourselves the story of what is most true, regardless of what is also true. And I think that's like the invitation. We've been saying this throughout the Advent season here at Epic. It is possible to wait without fear. It is possible. We're not saying it's easy to wait without fear. We're not saying you're likely in 2024 to wait without fear. We're just saying, if anything, God keeps whispering all throughout this drama we call Scripture. It's these words. You don't have to be afraid. It is possible to wait without fear. Yes, bad news is coming, but perhaps there could be good news that would ultimately supersede the bad news. And that's the message and meaning of Christmas. If you ask me, Ben, what are the things that you've most learned in 2023? I would tell you, here's one of them. It's that my mindset matters more than my circumstances. It's my outlook, my my perspective. It is not that I deny. And some people, even my closest friends, like, of course you think that. You're an optimist. Listen, I'm just telling you. Things happen to us, but we don't have to carry our lives and our emotion and our mental capacity. It doesn't have to be a one-to-one correlation with our circumstances. God has given us something else that's a little more sure in terms of foundation. One of my close friends who's spoken here at Epic a number of times, Joseph Barkley, he was helping me with this mindset piece, and he basically told me this. You'll see it on the screen. He said, Ben, it's just as easy to believe something positive about your future as it is to believe something negative about your future. And yet, we've gotten really good at imagining things going really bad. Or just me. Let me ask you this question. What would change in your life if you started imagining the unknown things in your future going really well? Just, just, you're like, Ben, I I don't think I can do that. Just, just, just answer the question. What, What would change if you could do this? What would change if you believed that there was a God who was with you? If you believe that his character was trustworthy, if you believe he's got a past resume and reputation that you can trust moving into your unknown future, but Ben, my health, I know he's got a word for you, but Ben, my family, I know, but he's still a foundation that holds no matter what comes. What if, because I think that's the invitation for you this Christmas, there's a God who wants to transform you that your future reality won't be ultimately based on the future events in our world and in your life, but a future that can be based on his character, his promises, his word, and his character, and his, and his timing. I believe that's the invitation for Christmas. So let me just ask you before we get into a pretty classic Christmas text of Scripture. Are you open? I didn't ask you to change yet. I'm just asking this question. Are you open? to changing how you anticipate and expect what's unknown about your future. I'm not trying to convince you just yet. I will do that. It's part of my job today. I will try to persuade you. I will use my God-given gifts, but those won't be enough. So I'll ask the Spirit of God to reveal to you what I could not be able to do by myself. But I am asking you, are you open to it? Because what the Christmas story reveals, if nothing else, is there were people who were anticipating bad news when heavenly beings showed up, and wouldn't you know it, it became the best news the planet has ever known or will ever know. We're in that classic text, Luke chapter 2. If you're able to, I'd love for you to stand as I read, um, yes, 20 verses. I mean, you've got to earn it this Christmas. Luke 2, 1 through 20, if you're not able or if you get worn out at verse 12, just have a seat. It's It's okay. It's a safe community, seriously. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. 
An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Again, before you have a seat, are you open to changing how you anticipate and expect what's unknown about your future? You may be seated. It's easy when we look back at history to see things as just being factual, but you've got to put yourself in Mary and Joseph's shoes. You've got to imagine that, okay, of course we're going to have this baby in Nazareth. I mean, in the back of their minds, right, there's this prophecy they're very familiar with about the Messiah coming from Bethlehem, but they're like, well, maybe it's something else, or maybe they got this one wrong. And all of a sudden, as Mary is crazy pregnant, they're like, hey, here's A decree from Caesar Augustus, the most powerful person, at least in what many believed, in the known world, certainly in the Roman Empire, saying that you've got to get to the the town of your lineage. So they begin to head to Nazareth and that or to Bethlehem from Nazareth, and that's where they are. And what it looks like is they're there because Caesar has issued this decree. You see, Mary and Joseph were living in a world like many people are living in a world today where they are surrounded by powerful people who get to choose this and get to choose that and determine what the world might look like around them. But Mary learned something in this day. I mean, uh, wouldn't it be just like God to allow Caesar to think he's got all power, issue this decree so that God's promise and prophecy would be fulfilled? Mary learned something that's become a prayer of mine. And if you're in a situation where you believe that there are powerful people who have control over what you can expect in the future, here's what Proverbs 21.1 says. In the Lord's hand, the king's heart is a stream of water that he channels toward all who please him. When the angel first showed up to Mary, he said, greetings, Mary, you who are highly favored, you who are highly favored, and that God was able to show her and Joseph and all the people who are willing to listen that, hey, I know everyone around here believes that Caesar is the name that's over every name in the Roman Empire, but I am here to introduce you to the name that's above that name and all other names. In fact, I want to ask you what you really believe deep down about this. Do you believe your life is ultimately in good hands or evil hands? You're like, Ben, I know the church answer. I'm not interested in the church answer. I'm interested in what you genuinely, from the depth of your core, believe. Because what you and I believe about the answer to this question will determine how we wait or how we don't wait. You see, we're all waiting. It's, it's not like I'm waiting and you're not waiting or this person beside you. We're all waiting for different things, maybe of even different kinds of importance. But we're all waiting. And what we believe, the answer to that question is whether there's a God who's got not only the power to control the events in the world, but do we believe he has a desire to control them for our good? And then in verse 6, there's a three-word phrase that shows up. There's lots to marvel at in the text, but I want you to see this three-word phrase. It just simply says, the time came. The time came. When when you, uh, I know you're just as patient as I am. Anybody just as patient as the pastor is? All we're wanting is for that moment to come. The time came. I waited until we saw about, to see about this, and the time came, right? We were living through this pandemic, and one day looked like the next, looked like the next, looked like the next. And then eventually the time came. Some of you are like, Ben, no, I've got it. Hopefully you're watching online if you have that thing. Um, But the time came. I remember when we were seeking to bring our daughter home from India in 2015. We had been waiting over three years. It seemed like it would not happen. Many of you were praying it in with us, delay after delay after delay. But eventually, about 38 months in, the time came. I don't know what you're longing for. 
I don't know what your heart is set on, and I'm not here to promise you circumstantial change. I am here to let you know that we're celebrating Advent, yes, the first coming of this baby, but we are also holding on until the time comes and Jesus takes us to a place where there will be no need for a sun or a moon because he's going to be the light for good. Amen. The time will come. The time will come. The time will come. God's timing is perfect. Here's how Paul said it in Galatians as he was reflecting back on this moment. I love this scripture at Christmas. A lot of times it doesn't get spoken of, so I just keep bringing it back up myself. Galatians 4, 4 through 7. But when the set time that we're celebrating today had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father, that's a term of endearment for a father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has also made you an heir. You, you see, we would all agree if I asked you, hey, true or false, the purpose of Christmas is to marvel at this baby who becomes a savior. You'd be like, true. But I'm here to tell you today, the purpose of Christmas isn't to marvel at baby Jesus, period. It is to marvel at baby Jesus, comma, because he has come to make us sons and daughters so that we might say what he says. So here's how I'll say it to you. When you realize that God sent Jesus to make you his heir, you begin to anticipate and expect a glorious future. I'm convinced that even those of us who call ourselves Christians don't believe this to our core because so many people are walking around believing that their ultimate future is in bad hands or it's just out of control and no one has it in their hands whatsoever. And this is the whole point of Christmas to go, hey, Mary and Joseph are discovering what God wants all of humanity to discover, which is that he can be trusted. His hands are the most powerful and they're the best hands. That's the life we've been invited into. And then you have these shepherds. I mean, just imagine what it was like for them. These guys, their vocation makes them unclean, which kept them from being able to worship in the temple. Imagine if you were walking in today and someone stopped you at the door and said, hey, tell me your vocation. And if you had a vocation that was considered to be unclean, we're like, hey, sorry, check us out online, but you can't come in today. The shepherds didn't know what it was like to worship in the temple. They were outcast. They had no vision for their future, and that's where some of you are sitting today. I mean, when today is like yesterday, and tomorrow is like today, and this week is like the last week, and this month is like last month, and this year is like last year, and there's no change. I mean, can you blame the shepherds for being socially outcast and having the same experience day after day after day? Can you blame them that they had such a small vision for their future? But there came a day where their vision began to expand, and maybe that would be your experience today. There came a day where they're like, okay, it's, <laughs> I love the text. Like some things in the Bible, you're just like, well, duh, that's obvious. Anybody? Like, so like outcasts who can't worship in the temple, a heavenly being shows up to them, and the text from Luke says, and they were terrified. <laughs> yeah. And here's why, and you might be able to relate to this. For the shepherds, you don't expect to find good news when you're convinced you deserve bad news. I mean, if a heavenly being's going to show up in the fields where the shepherds are watching their sheep, which they've done day after day after day, it's got to be because there's something wrong with them. I mean, imagine this. For your entire life, you've not been invited into the temple. How would you ever think you've been invited into the greatest story ever told? And I don't know who's labeled you. I don't know who's identified you. I don't know what your past has told you about your present or your future. I don't know what mom or dad gave you up. I don't know who let you go. I don't know about all of your exes, but I'm here to tell you, whoever has disinvited you from their story, I want you to know that God has invited you to the greatest story known to mankind. You might be rejected elsewhere. But one of the things that the angels tell the shepherds, like, listen, you might not be allowed in there, but you're being included in the Christmas story because you will be able to convince people, even sitting in a basement in San Francisco, you will be able to convince them of what the angels are saying to you is true. It is good news. It will be for great joy for all the people, for all the people. So whatever nation you come from, Whatever's true about your biological family, whatever's true about your current job or the fact that you're unemployed, whether you have the biggest house in this room or you are without a home in this room, I want you to know that you have been written into the greatest story you possibly could be. 
It says when the shepherds saw Jesus, they, or, or, or once they got this news, they said, hey, let's go see this thing that has taken place in Bethlehem. And I, I just want to ask you, like, what are you seeking really? So if we were sitting down one-on-one, -on -one, I would ask you this question. Don't answer it out loud, but I would love for you to sit with this question for the next week or so. It's a really good question going into New Year. I've been using it in different coaching conversations myself. Here's the question. Let's assume it's December 24th, 2024. And you and I are sitting down over coffee or tea or teenagers, boba. I mean, whatever you guys want to do, I'm down. I'm with it. And you begin to tell me, hey, when I started seeking this thing a year ago, I want you to know that I actually got what I sought. What would that be on your list? How would you fill in the blank? I'm so happy that I received blank because that's what I set my heart on this day. That's what I wanted. You see, I'm convinced that if you are looking, isn't it fascinating that we tend to find what we're looking for? Right? Like, Ben, tell me more. Well, let's assume that you are looking for a light blue Subaru Forester. You'll see it everywhere, won't you? Or if you're looking for an apartment to rent. Like, if you don't need housing, you tend to not see all the for rent signs everywhere. But if you're looking for it, like, you just see it everywhere. You will probably find what you're looking for. So if you're expecting to find hurt, I promise someone's going to hurt you. If you're looking for something to be anxious about, there is plenty to be anxious about. If you're looking for something to be afraid of, you guys, there's a lot of scary stuff out there. But if you're genuinely looking for joy or peace or love or hope, I think there's a good chance you'll find that also. You see, we think that truth is determined by what we do with what we hear. But let me ask you a question. Just play along with me. You can answer out loud. Let's assume we don't know what these shepherds did. Like, they received the invitation, but we have no idea what they did with it. So put yourself there, okay? Just block out all the things you know about the Christmas story. If those shepherds had remained in those fields, would a Savior still have been born in Bethlehem? You see, we set this up so that it looks like truth hinges on whether or not I get on board with it. But those shepherds could have stayed in the field, and the invitation was still the same. The history was still the same. The meaning from God's heart to humanity is still the same. And that's what's happening today. This message is coming to you and to you and to you. And you're like, I just showed up here because they promised me food if I'd sit through the service. You've heard it today. <laughs> and the reality of it doesn't hinge on what you do with it. Friend, your reality does hinge on what you do with it. Even as the pastor, this story doesn't hinge on what I say, who I tell, if I really believe it in my heart of hearts. It's truth. Now, John is one of the disciples that you know, may know about. And you're like, John the Baptist, no, is a different John. John, whose brother James and Peter, the three of them made up like the inner circle of Jesus. I mean, that's something you'd put on a letterman jacket, right? Like, boom. Boom. Like, yeah, we were one of the 12, but we were one of the three. You other nine, you were special, but not that special. <laughs> well, even amongst the three, John would write about himself. I am the one that Jesus loved. I'm like, that's fascinating, John. I thought God so loved the whole world, but apparently John, he's got a seat at the table that we don't get. But in the early chapter of John, the first one, he said that all of humanity who hears this invitation gets broken into only two categories. Here's how he said it. Jesus came to his own, but his own rejected him. They did not receive him, category one. But to those who did receive him, category two, to those who believed in his name, same category, he gives the right to become sons and daughters of God. Now, here's what I don't want anyone leaving today. We've got so many fun things planned to end our service, so we're going to end with smiles and laughter, I promise. I promise. But the reason this church puts on a Christmas Eve gathering is so that once again, or perhaps for the first time, you might know you've been invited into the story. 
with your past, yep, with your past. With all your hang-ups about God, with all your hang-ups about God. With all your doubts, yep, with all your doubts. With all your anger towards God because of what you experienced as a kid, with all your anger towards God. He has not gone anywhere. He is still pursuing you, and I believe he's doing it right here under the sound of my voice. So I want to ask you to take a posture of prayer, and I want to invite you to do what these shepherds did. You've heard the invitation the greatest invitation you'll ever receive. And uh, there's nothing I can do. I don't even know if God would do anything to force anybody in this room to be in the receiving category. But if you would want to receive today, I'm going to ask you just to raise your hand. I would love to pray for you to receive and respond to this invitation. Just raise a hand. I'd love to pray for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll pray out loud, and you can just say words similar to this or exactly this in your own heart. Jesus, to be honest, I wasn't sure this invitation was for me. You you know the reasons. You know my doubts. You know how hard it is to believe. Or, Or maybe, Jesus, you know my past. You know what I've done or haven't done this year or maybe even this weekend. But if you're telling me that what you told the shepherds is true, that, that you came to give good news that would lead to great joy for all the people, then, okay, I, I believe that this is also for me. And I receive you. I receive you as you are, as the Son of God, as the coming Messiah, as the Savior of the world, and and I believe you. I believe that you are who you say you are. I believe you gave your life for my sins. I believe that you were crucified, you were buried, but that you rose from the dead so that you might overcome my fears and you might overcome my sin. So today, yes, Jesus, I receive your invitation to become a daughter or a son of the Most High God. In your name I pray. Amen.